Hey, so previously on this series, we've learned about data types and how to sample from inputs. So I think it's time to make some particles move, shall we? Here we have some points scattered around in a two dimensional space. How do you get that? Well, start with the render network. Add an add cell, plug it into a convert cell, and then into a gel comb. Now we need to enable add points, convert those points into particles, and enable instancing. You can add a camera, a constant mat for your gel comp, and a render top. If you take a noise top, set it to 32 bit float, disable monochrome, bring the offset to zero, and use it as a translate operator with channels for X and Y. You get this. If you want your points to be more random, you can just decrease the period. So here we use each pixel in the buffer as a storage for our X and Y positions. Now we can add a GLS cell top. Dive into the code. Sample those positions from the input, rename the variable to pose, and output it into the buffer. Let's also add a null here and use that null for instancing instead of the noise one. I want to move these points and one can do that easily, just add something to the X or Y of the position. If I want to move them more, I can add a larger value. Would be cool though if that addition could happen on its own and that's where we can make use of a feedback top. Insert a feedback top right here and drag the null into its target top field. In order to have a quick reset button, let's also add a keyboard in chop. So what happens is, on each frame we are increasing points position x by one and a half. So if you check out the values for the x, x position is stored in the red channel, you can see that those particles are probably on their way out of the observable universe. One and a half is a bit too much, so let's set it to something smaller than maybe 0.0001. Reset the feedback and yeah, they are moving, but it's now way too slow for what I want. And I hope you can see the problem here. Going back to the code every time you want to change this value is kind of inconvenient. What we can do instead is to utilize uniform variables. Think of uniforms as custom parameters that you can easily pass inside your GLSL top while it's running. So go to the vectors tab of the GLSL top. Here you can set a uniform's name, let's call it speed. And now, in our code, we can utilize that uniform by declaring a variable. Uniforms are usually defined above everything else, and if you have multiple uniforms, it's a good practice to keep them all together so that you wouldn't have to search for them once your code gets more complicated. We want to write uniform float speed. And now, instead of adding this hard-coded value, we can use speed. You can dial in the exact value you want while it's moving. But it's always moving right, and I wanted to control the direction of that movement. Th that's also quite easy. We can just add another uniform, call it deer, and set everything to zero for now. We are operating in a two-dimensional space, so our direction vector has to have x and y components only, which means we are going to use a vec2. Given a speed and direction, we can find velocity, which is kind of like a product of speed and direction. Instead of just adding speed to the x, we can now add velocity to both x and y. Now, controlling direction becomes quite an easy task. In fact, we can add a mouse in chop and use TX and TY channels to control the direction. But here is another problem. By moving the mouse, we are affecting the speed. If you move your cursor further away from the center, particles start to move faster. Because, for example, these two direction vectors have different length. 
So a good approach is to set direction to a unit vector length. That's a vector which length equals one. And you can do that by calling a normalize function on the direction. Yeah, now the velocity is consistent, probably too much. It doesn't feel like particles at all. Well, you can randomize this movement. We are going to need another noise stop. Connect it to the second input, set it to 32-bit float and dial down the period and harmonic gain to zero. We can sample from the second input before we calculate velocity. Let's call it factor and add factor r into our velocity calculation. Good! Some particles are moving fast while others are super slow and if you want you can also animate the noise in the z-axis to make the particles change their behavior every now and then. But overall this system is still quite boring. It lacks details because everything is too predictable. A good thing is, we don't have to stick with only one velocity. Th that's right, you can combine multiple velocities and mix them just like you would mix different tops in a composite top. Here's where we need to address a bit of factor math. Don't be afraid, won't be anything too complicated. First of all, you can use the particle's position as a direction vector. Let me show you. If your particle is somewhere over here, and the world origin is somewhere over here, you can calculate a vector pointing at the particle from the world origin. To do that, you just subtract your starting point, the world origin, from your finish point, the, the particle's position. And now you have a vector, although the actual values haven't changed at all. So let's create another vec2, call it vel2, and it should be equal to speed multiplied by normalized position xy and our factor. Let's use a vel2 instead of vel. Our particles are flying away. So what if you want your particles to rotate around the world origin? That's also quite easy, especially in 2D. You need to take a particle's position xy and your direction vector should be equal to a vector of position minus y and x. Let's create another vector, call it vel3 and it's going to be speed multiplied by this vector. If you now use it to affect position, you're going to get this spiral movement. So now that we have these three different velocities, we can combine them however we like. The first option is to just combine them, you know. Let's make another back two, call it vel total, and it's going to be just the sum of all our velocities. Now let's use it to move position. That's already quite a complex behavior. Particles are trying to escape the world origin, rotate around it, and also move towards the cursor. So can we do better? Y yeah, I want to make it so that particles that are above some distance threshold stop rotating at all. I can say vel total equals vel. And if a distance, which is another handy GL cell function, between position xy and vec2 of zeros, which is the world origin, is less than 0.5, then vel total is going to be increased by the vel3 that represents rotation. Another option is to use a mix function instead of a hard threshold. Let's store our distance in another variable float, uh, call it dist. And now we can use it to mix between two different velocities. It works like a crosstop. You put something into input 1, something goes into input 2, and then you need a factor for mixing. So let's say that vel total equals a mix of vel3, vel, and dist. The further away a particle goes, the more it will follow the cursor instead of rotating around the center. We can also play with the distance variable. Um, let's take a sign of the distance as a mix factor, but also multiply it by some value, like 
20. If you now remember what we've started with, you can use a uniform. Let's call it sign factor and use it to multiply our distance with. Again, like with any other topic in this course, I highly encourage you to come up with your own ideas for different movement behaviors. Honestly, the more you experiment with it, the more you're going to understand. That's about it for now. Thank you for watching. If you want to support this channel, consider becoming a patron over on Patreon. And I'll see you in the next one.